Uh, welcome to Winterviews Series 2, Episode 1. I am your host, Catherine Silva, Cat for short. And we're very fortunate to be blessed with Todd Kiesling this evening, uh, who has just re-released his Bram Stoker Award-nominated work, Devil's Creek, uh, which is very small-town horror-oriented. Uh, which is part of our conversation tonight. Um, Todd, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> relieved. I'm relieved. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm good. Uh, getting over a case of the, the flu or the, the crud or whatever you want to call it. So my voice is a little deeper than normal. Uh, no, I'm great. I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful that you... Uh, you know, asked me to be on, so thank yeah. you. Well, it's, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of fun doing this last year, and it just seemed like it would be good to have a whole new group of people join. More the Twitter side this time. Last time it was very, um, like, New England Horror Writers, Facebook-oriented, so uh, we have a whole new group for you this season, everybody. It's going to be lots of fun, but... Let's get right into the meat and potatoes of it. So, we're talking I about... Like, I like meat and potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're talking about small town horror and cosmic horror this evening. And I want to start out by discussing small town horror. Um, the subject... I, I personally am really, really a fan of small town horror in books, film... Uh, TV and games. Um, in your experience, Todd, what is it about small towns in horror that resonate with readers? Well, I think many of us, most of us, I think, uh, we've all got experience living in a small town, whether we were born there or we lived there for a while. Uh, you know, small towns are alluring because it's not, <clears throat> there's something personal about it, I think. Like, you know, if you talk about a major metropolitan city, well, it's it's impersonal, it's cold, it's, that's that's what my impression uh, of, a, you know, of a large city like New York, for like, you take New York, for example, nothing against New York. Uh, even if there are too many people who live there. Um, it's just a very impersonal place to me. But you take a small, tiny town of like two, 3,000 people, like the town I live in currently, and it's very intimate because you're more likely to know everybody. Uh, you know everybody's story. You know, sometimes you know their history. Uh, you know, there's a penchant for gossip um so it's just a lot more um i'm repeating myself but it's a lot more personal and i think that when it comes to small town horror it is alluring to readers because one they've got the experience of living in a small town and two you know it's almost like the stakes are higher because it's a more close-knit community, mm. I think. I'm sure there could be something you know, psychological to say about that, but I'm not a psychologist, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that totally makes sense. And and the, the thing that I take away from it, too, is, like, it is almost... It's a safe space, you know, you've... Yeah. Grown up in it, it, it everything is familiar. Um, it feels like a space that's less likely to have something terrifying happen in. So when something does happen, it's just that much more uh, horrible and, and yeah, frightening. like it, it's it's more likely to hit home when it's you know something explodes in your neighbor's backyard. Yeah, you know literally and figuratively it's closer to home um you know like i think red 
Hi, Red. <laughs> uh, said it's a little claustrophobic, and I, I think she, she nailed it right there. Um, someone also commented and said that sometimes you're all related. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't go that far, Lisa. <laughs> Guess it depends on hey. where you are. Yeah. Would not go that far, but uh, anyway. There's um, a couple towns around here where it's it's actually pretty frightening how many people are just, you know, distantly related through um, marriage and, you know, the various brothers and sisters uh, that have just kind of proliferated. But, uh, but yeah, I remember just having friends say, like, oh yeah, and my that random person that we ran into at the, you know, grocery store is my mm -hmm. second cousin's aunt or, you know, whatever. Some like, weird. not even in terms of, like, blood relation, but just you're always, like, several degrees away from someone because of someone that you know mutually. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I talked about this on, on previous uh, podcast and whatnot, but like, so, the hometown, I, the, my, my hometown, the small town I grew up in, uh, Corbin, Kentucky, <clears throat> my graduating class was about 100 people. And I knew probably 75% of them I'd known since kindergarten. Like, you know, that generation, we all grew, went to school together. Our families, in, in a lot of cases, their, their families went to school together. And, you know, their grandparents went to school together. They've all mm -hmm. lived in the same area there, you know, for generations. So they all kind of grow up. They know each other. You know, so-and-so's dating so-and-so's cousin. Well, because of that, then they know that the other family, you know, the, the ins and outs there. And you get this very insular community. Yeah where everyone knows everyone's business not you know not because they're trying to be nosy but because that's just the nature of it you know because everyone knows someone yep so no that's uh that's the long and short of it for sure i also grew up in a very very small town we're talking like a thousand people, maybe. Wow! If that. Okay. Um, and there That's is smaller than Corbin. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's tiny. It's uh, and there's you know, it's Union is the name, and then there's all these other towns around that like Friendship, and Unity, and Freedom, and uh. But there's definitely that, like, if you didn't grow up there and you didn't uh, go to church in the town if you didn't uh go to all of the functions founders day and you know the bake sale and whatnot then you were kind of not in the community yeah so there's that exclusion also and that can be a, a <clears throat> sense of uh of horror um, I, I, I think small towns kind of are a good setting for horror specifically because of that kind of alienation that happens because not everyone's going to fit into that mold. Mm -hmm. That's my, one of my cats. Nim says, hello, everybody. Um, you're, you know, if you're like me, you were an outcast growing up, uh, because you're, you know, your family wasn't from a specific, you know, side of the the uh, county line essentially mm -hmm. um, and that that attitude is so was so pervasive in school growing up that you know you were frowned upon you know they could tell you you were an outsider even though you literally grew up in the same town they treated you like an outsider and that that kind of alienation is almost synonymous with a small town mm -hmm. I think you know like I didn't 
I was the goth kid. I'd listen to, to dark music while everybody was listening to boy bands and pop. And, you know, I wore black. Everybody else is wearing the bright pastel shit from Gap and, you know, Old Navy and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, it was uh, Corbin's a football town. I did not play football. Don't have the physique for it. Sorry. Uh, you know, hold on a second. <laughs> like laying on my keyboard Mm -hmm. um but there was always this sense of class structure you know a pecking order in growing up there and you know in my mind that's something you can't write small town horror without discussing that because you know it's human nature sadly and you just that's always going to be prevalent in a small knit community. There's always going to be haves and have nots. And especially like, for example, this have not here, which is my cat who keeps jumping on my desk and looping his tail. Uh, <laughs> he just wants to be in the center of my attention. Yep. Well, uh, anyway, uh, I'm rambling anyway. So. <laughs> well, uh, I also was the outcast in school, so I totally relate there. Um, and, uh, uh-oh, I lost Todd. Oh, you're there. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm here. That was my cat. The cat. Oh, the cat yeah. is sabotaging. I'm sabotaging. There's lots of sabotage. Go listen yeah. to the Beastie Boys after this. Um, so, um, next in discussion about small town horror is, um, you know, we've kind of touched upon a few things, but the creating a memorable small town in, in horror fiction, which you, so far, I'm in the middle of reading Devil's Creek and it's just like so apparent how well you've done in creating Stafford as this sort of hub for all the nefarious shit that's going down. Thank you. Um, but how, how do you go about making sure that people sort of remember this town long after they've finished reading the book? I approached it from the perspective of creating or viewing the town as a character in the book. So it's got its ups and downs. It's got a personality. It's, you know, it's got a good side and a bad side. And it's, you know, in the case of Stafford, it's more bad than good. Um, but that for me was one of my goals when I started writing the book was to establish the town as a character and the way that I found and just from reading other small town horror stories and kind of studying them and under, you know, dissecting them to kind of understand what makes them tick the way to do that is through its people because a town isn't a town without its people and so that's why you know I'm going to use Stephen King as an example because Salem's Lot was one of the big inspirations to me for this book, <clears throat> and he's done this through every small town story he's ever written. He introduces a large cast, and you've got your central cast, but you also have all these peripheral characters, you know, doing their own things, and they're kind of like interweaving the main plot thread, but never really having you know a, a central purpose to the plot itself like they are there to demonstrate how you know the plot has wide reaching effects like the, the impacts of the plot uh, the big bad whatever he or she or they may be in the story you know their plans are put in motion and it impacts not just the main characters but everyone mm-hmm. you use the, the 
these side characters to demonstrate that. But to do, but in order to make the reader care, you also bring, you know, give us a snippet into their lives, you give us, you know, their their wants and you know needs, their dreams, their fears, and they're kind of like a, a microcosm version of your main character. You know, they have their own little you know, character arcs and what have you. And if you cut them out of the story, you know, are you going to lose a lot? I mean, in terms of, it depends on the kind of story you're trying to tell, first of all, but in my opinion, you would lose the essence of that town as a character. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's, it's one thing to write a fast-paced plot that goes from point A to B to C to D, all the way down to Z, like, you know, like clockwork. You know, like, most thrillers are written that way. You introduce side characters and it slows the plot down. Yeah, it does. But you're also building up this other entity in the town itself. Um, to, to me, that that's necessary. You, you can't really have a, a good well-rounded small town story without the people without telling the stories of the people who live in it even mm-hmm. if they're not the central focus of the plot <laughs> yep I agree um, that like that it immediately makes me think of um, just slow burn horror and and small town horror kind of uh, romancing each other being a good fit for one another um and the book that i always return to is um dan simmons the summer of night yeah uh for small town story but just like also really slow burn story that really does a great job of um building up that town and making what's going on in it more and more insidious. Um, just, it's a really good book. Yeah, I, like, it also helps to have that, you know, degree of separation. So even if you have this side character who's completely unrelated to the, the main character who's driving your plot forward, Odds are they're going to know somebody who knows the main character, Mm -hmm. or they're going to know someone who knows someone who's related to the main character. There's always going to be a way to tie them back to one of the main drivers of the story. Yeah. And, you know, if you were to cut that thread loose, you know, in a traditional, you know, fast paced plot, you're not going to miss them. You know, you're not, because they don't need to be there. But small town horror story, especially is by nature a slow burner and slow burners take their time to get you know to get to the payoff but in doing so allows so much more time with these characters that again fill out the space of the town itself excuse me and what is a small town without its especially quirky characters too absolutely Um, like you know it's like look at look at uh twin peaks for example oh yes twin peaks is a perfect example you have so many characters that do absolutely nothing for the plot that goes forward but if you were to take them out it wouldn't be twin peaks Yep. you know like do we really need do we really need benjamin horn's little brother (laughs) no but he's part of what makes Twin Peaks Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. Same goes with Dr. Jacoby in the third season. <laughs> you don't really need him. You don't need Nadine. You don't need them there, but it would feel weird to not have them there. Yeah. Yeah, they're part of what makes Twin Peaks Twin Peaks, for sure. Um, so we did, we touched upon, you know, town as a character in the narrative, um... And we've sort of talked about how 
you use small town horror in your works to pull readers in. Um, I guess the next thing I want to know is you, we've talked a, about a few of uh, good examples of small town horror in uh, books and TV and movies. What are some of your favorite examples? Uh, I mean, Salem's Lot, of course. Twin Peaks, of course. Um, Gaming-wise, I would say Alan Wake. Yes. I guess a good one. Yes. Uh, that was just what I was thinking about. Yeah, Alan Wake is a great example, I think, um, of small-town horror. Even though that game isn't billed as small-town horror, it absolutely is mm-hmm. small-town horror, among many other things. Uh, you know, those would be my, I would say, are my favorites. Um, one that doesn't really get discussed as small town horror per se is uh, Boy's Life by Robert McCammon. Mm. Um, that's a hundred percent coming of age, but it's also a small town story. Yeah, and I think that's a good, another good example. Uh, I don't know if it would necessarily classify as small town, and it ha- admittedly has been a while since I've read it. But uh, Clive Barker's *The Great Secret Show*, hmm. uh, the town of you know Palomo Grove, uh, definitely gets fleshed out in that story. Um, you could probably, you know, I would say that's small town horror adjacent. Okay. Um, do we think that *Silent Hill* is a small town horror? Or is it more... That's that's kind of a, a stretch, I think, because yeah. you don't... I mean, you only get a small group of characters. You don't really get a sense of the town as a living, breathing town. That's you're fair. You're experiencing it. It's kind of... You're experiencing it dead. from, you know, a deserted perspective, a devoid of life, or devoid of normal life. <laughs> and, uh, you know... Although I'm sure if if Rob Atone were here right now, he'd probably, you know, fight me over that. But, you know, I don't think you could classify it as a small-town horror story. Uh, in the future, he is watching this on YouTube and screaming at his screen. That's, That's fine. Let yeah, him scream. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. It's, it's definitely, you know, uh, not seeing Silent Hill sort of in its... Uh, prime i guess we're we're definitely seeing the the alternate version of it um so it's and it's the horror is not necessarily because of its small townness it's because of supernatural uh stuff yeah. that happened otherwise um like I was going to yes so you had you had said something about uh, you were talking about the book that was coming a of age horror and small town horror and mm-hmm. I do want to uh, I want to let people know in the chat that we did do an episode in series one with Tom Deedy about coming of age and small town horror so that episode is available to watch on YouTube if you are interested in seeing a little more of that uh, together. Tom's definitely a good person to talk to about that subject. That was one of the episodes where my mic wasn't working, so you get to hear <sighs> him talk all about it uh, while I make gesticulations on the screen. Um, <laughs> And uh, so now we're going to switch gears. We're going to go over to Cosmic Horror, uh, which admittedly is one that I have not written. uh, I haven't written any Cosmic Horror. I do really enjoy it, like watching it, playing it, uh, reading it. And um, so I have lots and lots of questions about writing it. (laughs) Um, So my first question is, what is it about cosmic horror that really uh, interests you, that really, like, makes you want to write it? 
thing about cosmic horror that does it for me, I guess, is it kind of reflects my viewpoint of, you know, of myself and, you know, our place as a species in the universe in that we don't matter. Mm. (laughs) You know, it's... Cosmic Horror was once described to me as, you know, a kid with a magnifying glass burning ants on a sidewalk, Mm. except we're the ants. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if higher powers exist, and if they do, then they aren't necessarily uh, of spiritual significance, but they're simply a you know, an alien force or being that we can't comprehend. Um, you know, what we do is of no consequence to them. And, you know, they're not going to explain themselves to us. And in the scheme of things, you know, we're specks of dust, you know, floating in a cosmic, you know, in a cosmic void. You know, it, it at the end of the day it doesn't matter like all this you know our mortgages our credit cards our you know our credit scores our politics none of it fucking matters they're very yeah human things very yeah they're very human concerns that in the scheme of things don't matter it's like when i when i worked in an office uh, for a corporation i won't mention Anytime something would, you know, catastrophically break and it would be my department's job to fix, you know, I would just kind of chuckle and say, you know what, hey, in a few billion years, the sun's going to expand and consume the planet and none of this will fucking matter. No one really got the joke. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But to me, that, that that is the appeal of cosmic horror to me personally. It's, you know, man's, it's mankind's, almost mankind being forced to face its insignificance in the universe. Mm. And I just feel like, you know, I try to keep that in perspective on my own life. You know, it's like, hey, you know, it kind of goes along with that old saying, this too shall pass. Well, it will. It will pass. Because it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah know in scheme of things so better to live your life you know as best you can and be happy for the time that you have here um you know it's mankind being forced to gaze upon that insignificance and recognize that and i think that we as a society and as a species will be far happier if we embrace that not our you know, <clears throat> not our importance of, you know, not our self-importance, but embrace our fleeting time here mm-hmm. and do more with it. And I, I so that's why cosmic horror, you know, really does it for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it'd be, it's also, it's probably, to me, it's also one of the most philosophical versions of horror that we're going to get. Um, and, you know, I used to be a philosophy nerd in college, and so it kind of ticks that box for me. Hmm. So I noticed the comments have stopped, so I probably just, like, <laughs> offended everybody and caused them to check out. I think the, the comments kind of stopped, like, a, a little ways back. Um, we were still talking about small town horror, so... Uh- I'm not really sure why. Maybe everybody's just totally engrossed, uh, and you know, it's my, it's gotta be my voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. There's like, there's definitely something, something to be said for, um, for the idea that cosmic horror does kind of put you in your place a little bit and that it does force you to uh look at everything and and see just how small of a speck you are compared to 
whatever else is going on in the universe. Um, yeah. And and I guess my next question about that is when you're creating characters in cosmic horror, generally there is this, you know, unnameable sort of like unfathomable thing uh, that people can't quite grasp and uh, and sometimes might make them lose their minds or, you know, yeah. as, as the H.P. Lovecraft would generally have is, people... <laughs> yeah, that is very much a Lovecraft trope, and I love it. Um, uh, you know, people... The idea being that, like, once you witness the truth and witness something that is completely alien to your, you know, that just blows your mind so hard <laughs> that it breaks your psyche. Like, you're, you just go insane at the mere possibility of what is presented to you. I love that. Um, so I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was going to say... Um... How do you, uh, what's your method for going about creating, uh, something in that, uh, something that is, you know, hard to describe, but, uh, but, you know, is kind of like the otherworldly being, uh, that people just can't quite handle. Yeah, it, on one hand, it's kind of easy because you don't have to describe it. <laughs> you can only, you know, you rather rather than show show the monster for lack of a better term, uh, you show the effect it has. And you know, like you can offer glimpses to it, but I try to, one, I try to show the impact that being around it, you know, can have on people or on one's psyche, but also try to do things that demonstrate how vast it is. Mm -hmm. Like, there was a, a story that was on Pseudopod several years ago called Shadow Transit. I can't remember for the life of me who wrote it. I'm sure somebody online will you know, chime in if they, they know what I'm talking about. But the whole story is about the government rounding up children who are touched psychically hmm. and are naturally predisposed to be in touch with a cosmic entity. And it drives the children insane. Huh. And... It's from the parent's perspective of having, you know, what it's like being a parent to a child that is in touch with a, you know, an eldritch being that is described as being the size of a continental shelf. Hmm. And that's always stuck with me because we have no concept of how large something like that really is. You know, if you were to stand next to something like that, you would be a speck. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, we know this, that space is huge. We know that the universe is ever-expanding, and it's enormous. It's so fucking big, we can't fathom it. You know, like, the, the closest star besides our own sun is so far away, <laughs> you know. And you take that, that space in mind and then realize that there's like 200 billion billion more of those out there and this is Ophelia <laughs> hi sweetheart I've seen all the kids. she hates it when I hold her like a baby Aww. my little girl I was gonna say you know, okay, and, go on. your cats are all like jumping into the yeah. frame mine is You're just like, hey dad can I be on the show can I be on the show mine is totally um, sacked out next to us like... <laughs> so I try to create these characters that 
are just regular people that are faced with, you know, the they're faced with the uh, abominable aspect of you know the chaotic nature of the universe. Mm -hmm. They're you know you have to have something that puts their significance in question. So, you know, like, like take the, you know, you take at the mountains of madness that love, mm -hmm. you know, by Lovecraft and you've got this crew of scientists going down to Antarctica to study and coming across a mountain range that is larger than any known mountain range on record. And they'd realize that it's not a mountain range. It's like, you know, structures that have been built by, uh, you know, a, a whole other race of creatures. And just the sheer, you know, the mountains of madness. That's because it, to, to comprehend its existence and comprehend what built, built it would drive one insane. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, you have the self-importance of man facing something that completely obliterates that self-importance. And, you know, the idea being that it, it changes you. Uh, you know, I try to do things a little differently. I try to, <clears throat> I try to have characters that maybe have uh, you know, a different different reaction to it, like like I wrote a story that's uh, it was in the Arterial Bloom anthology Arterial Bloom, and it's going to be in my next collection uh, it comes out later this year uh, it's called Happy Pills and it's about a guy who is suffering from extreme anxiety and depression and his doctor recommends he takes a, you know, signs up for this experimental drug study. And the drug itself is actually a black pill that it basically, without spoiling anything, the drug itself is, opens a gateway in his mind. Hmm. That puts him in touch with a you know another being, and the effect that it has upon him. <clears throat> you know, I try to. You always want to try to show something different from what's the the trope, you know, mm -hmm. or at least like take a, a new twist on the old trope, because otherwise, then you're just writing the trope, and it's not as interesting because yeah. everybody's seen that before, or they've read that. Before. Uh, so the, the challenge then becomes, well, how can I, you know, how can I demonstrate this trope, but on my own terms? So this one, however, <laughs> this one, she's the supreme cosmic beast. <laughs> she drives me insane every day. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Um, you're mentioning black pills immediately, uh, brought to mind John dies at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a, you know, not gonna lie. It inspired that, you know, the, uh, shit. What did they call it in John dies at the end? Oh, God. Oh I no, remember. I can't remember it wasn't, either. It wasn't the messenger. That's Colin Barker. Uh, yeah, I. I, I don't remember. remember. It's been so long since I've read John um, Dies at the end. Yeah, I um. I I that was a book I went into not knowing what to expect, and I just absolutely fell in love with it, and. I think I even liked a book full of spiders more, um, but I have not I, I, read the rest. I remember liking this book is full of spiders yeah. a lot more because it was a bit more co like concise. John dies at the end, kind of you know, 
meanders a bit. It does. Yep. It was called soy sauce. Yes, that's right. Erica just messaged me to yep. let me know. Thanks, honey. Soy sauce, that's right. <clears throat> Um, so in relation, flip my page, in relation to creating, uh, the otherworldly characters and, and basically describing them by having people just sort of react to them, but not just react to them, you know, uh, yeah. When you're creating, uh, is it the same, do you use the same idea when you're trying to create, like, a, a space, uh, versus a, um, being? Like, if it was a, a place beyond comprehension, is that kind of the same idea, or is there a little bit more to work with in terms of, like, reactionary... So there's a, a place that I describe in Devil's Creek that I can't really talk much about because it's kind of the main focus, like everything's going to converge on that place. Spoilers. Um, and it's described as a grotto. It's a moonlit grotto. And that's how it's perceived. It's how it appears. But it's something else entirely. And I think you need to have... You need to have... A, you know, some familiarity. Like something that's grounded that people will relate to. So like when they see it at a glance, they think it's one thing. And even in Devil's Creek, I don't outright tell you what it is, really. And that's by design. Um, but I give you enough that it's a familiar landscape, but it's also entirely alien for various reasons. And I think having that enhances the uncanniness of whatever it is you're trying to describe uh, because it it kind of it's kind of like giving them something to hold on to but as they're holding on to it you're chipping away at it making it less and less a familiar concept mm -hmm. than they thought it was uh, they being the readers and you know that to me, that's uh, more effective, I think. Uh, like, I, I wrote a story called The Smile Factory. And it takes place inside a corporate office building. But in the universe of this story, it's a corporate office building that's been, you know, basically overtaken by eldritch, eldritch entities for the production of a product and everybody who works there has been corrupted by this eldritch force. They don't remember when they started. They've just always worked there. And so it has the air of familiarity, but then there's also this little, these little things like, you know, that turn it on, turn, turn it on its head a little bit. You know, you kind of, you're, 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 demonstrating to the reader a familiar scene with a, you know, with a painting, right? But then you're kind of tilting it a little bit. Hmm. And you don't want to tilt it too far because then it becomes obvious. You want to tilt it just a teeny bit so that it's off kilter, but then they have to look at it a while before they realize that's not right. Hmm. <clears throat> it's the best way I can think to describe it in... in oh, like more concrete terms really well <laughs> um no i like that a lot um so into our favorite examples of cosmic horror um you know 
what what else have you sort of been inspired by or uh, have remembered as being just a really integral piece for you? So Lovecraft for all of his problems and xenophobia and racism his stories and concepts have been you know I mean it it really changed my perception of what horror could be Uh, beyond that uh, Robert Chambers with King and Yellow stories Mm -hmm. Um, more recently Ted Klein's The Ceremonies Mm -hmm. uh, John Langan's The Fisherman um, pretty much everything by Laird Barron Uh, The Croning his novel The Croning especially is such a great piece of cosmic horror Um, his short fiction is perfect Mm -hmm. Um, you know that in terms of film like John Carpenter's The Thing like his whole apocalypse Mm -hmm. trilogy The Thing, Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness um, are you know perfect representation of the cosmic horror um, Stuart Gordon's you know take on Lovecraft from beyond it's a good example of cosmic horror done right <clears throat> um, in comics uh, Shoji Ito's uh, Uzumaki mm-hmm. series uh, Uzumaki Spiral that's great um, Gideon Falls yes. I forget who wrote it but uh, Gideon yeah. Falls, the you know that whole series is. I just just got book six. I've been looking for uh, it for forever, and I oh, just yeah. picked it up. So we're like looking forward to finally finishing it. Yeah, a buddy of mine turned me on to Gideon Falls before volume like it was right around the time that volume six first came available. So I was fortunate enough to be able to read it, and then as soon as I'd finished part five, volume six came out. Nice. So I didn't have a gap in waiting. It yeah. was just like, you know. So I got turned on to that at the right time. But yeah, Gideon Falls is a great example of cosmic horror. Mm-hmm. Uh, in comic in comics anyway. So Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um Uh Dead Space is a good cosmic horror story yep uh it's pretty it's a little bit more in your face splatter wise but it's still a you know an unfathomable alien force you know that you know mm-hmm. is fighting you know you're fighting against this um alan wake in a little way in some ways could be considered cosmic horror mm-hmm. it definitely has some lovecraftian undertones Signalis, most recently Signalis. Mm, That's a great cosmic horror game. Okay. I'll have to look into that one. Um, I I made a couple notes. I um, I did read The Worm and His Kings by Haley Piper last yes. year. That's a great one. The sequel is coming out this year, I think. Maybe it's next year, I don't but know. Um, anyway, fantastic horror novella. Um, and then the other one that I put down, which is like, I, they list it as being uh, cosmic horror, but it's also weird horror, but Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. That is definitely cosmic um, horror. That, like, I love that book. Um that's that was definitely one of my like first horror experiences because I hadn't quite figured out what I was writing um, yeah. back in the day and and that like just cemented my love for writing horror um, and wanting to write more horror and natural horror at that um, and then. Um, 
I was fortunate enough to get to read and, and help uh, Barry lead to Jasu on his collection that he released last year, which is very uh, has has cosmic horror in it throughout, mm -hmm. um, and that collection is just amazing it's called uh, black city skyline and darker horizons um and that's definitely one that y'all should check out yeah uh so i haven't read barry's collection but i i read a, a short story of his um gave feedback on it a few years ago that was blew me away it's uh tri tryptophobia yeah i think is what it's called um amazing. Yeah, he's he's just the whole the collection as a whole is just solidly put together and um yeah, just well done. Um so we're in the wrap up portion now of the program. Um so I have a couple more questions just very loose, easy. Uh, what's your favorite subgenre of small town horror? Like, if you classify it with like another kind of horror, what what do you like to see it paired up with? Uh, occult, folky, uh, occult and cult. Uh, you know, concepts, um, folk concepts. Like, like Harvest Home or The Wicker Man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I love to see that. I love to see more of that. Um, the more like weird, culty aspects, of, like the first season of True Detective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to see that. Uh, you know, when it comes to small town stuff, like. Uh, Adam Neville's The Reddening comes mm. to mind. Uh, I actually have a copy of Last Days, which I've heard is incredible. Uh, his book, also about a cult, but, you know, it's also like a million pages long, and I, yeah. my time is short. <laughs> so, I, it's on my list. Yeah, I regrettably still have not read any um, of Adam Neville. I have seen... Uh, the ritual and I have seen the I think it's No One Gets Out Alive was the yeah. name of the other one both yeah. of which were awesome and I've been meaning to put him on my TBR uh, Ronald Malfi's Black Mouth I haven't gotten that it's, one uh, yet either really good. yeah you gotta read that one I think I'm gonna try and pick it up at AuthorCon so I can you know yeah. Get the full experience, but yes. You're going to AuthorCon? Yeah, I got a table. Yay! Yep. Yay! Yep. That's should exciting. Be, should be exciting. It's going to be very big, I think, this year. Uh, yeah. I can hear Erica from down the hall. She's also <laughs> saying, yay! <Yeah. laughs> yep, I, am, uh, I have a table next to John Durgin. I'm pretty excited okay. about that and Tom Deedy is like right across the way I think so it should be okay. should be good nice yeah um uh my second question is uh have you ever pulled from situations that happened to you when you were writing small town horror this is a loaded question oh, I'm sorry it's super loaded <laughs> uh yeah like a good chunk of Devil's Creek was all called from personal experiences um the bullying aspect with the character mm. with the character Riley being bullied and yeah. you know kind of being treated as this outcast figure because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, the main character Jack is kind of like an alternate reality version of me. If I had pursued my, you know, if I had just remained on track and gone to art school as opposed to just going to university and majoring in English. <clears throat> um, you know, the grandmother Imogene is based on my great-grandmother Mildred, uh, mm. the granny. I've uh, written about her 
you know, a couple times, but I wanted to kind of honor her memory and turn her into an absolute badass. That's awesome. Uh, so, you know, she's she's a main part of, of Devil's Creek. Um, the dream sequence that Jack has after he discovers his grandmother's uh, notebook, that's an actual recurring dream that I had all through college. Um, that's, you know, that was one of the central inspiration points for the book was that dream um you know, there's lots of little things i mean the town of stafford kentucky is my hometown corbin like i changed some street names i changed some of the geography to make it suit the story but which is also why i changed the name but originally for like the first hundred pages it was corbin it wasn't stafford yeah um but I had to make some of those changes to suit the story, so it just made more sense to change the name. Yeah. Um, you know, you're when you go, when you visit Stafford in the book, you are visiting, you're visiting my hometown. Like the map that's in the new edition is, it's the map of Corbin. Hmm. You know, it, it's it's all the major highways in Corbin. It, it's uh, you know, it's a so people ask, have asked me, like, how did you write this massive book with all these characters in this place? And I'm like, well, because half the work was already done. Yeah. You know, I grew up there. I, I know that area intimately, so there wasn't really any research I had to do. You know, and when it came to that, like, I didn't have to build this place. It already exists. So all I did was change some names. Yeah. So the answer to your question <laughs> is yes. Yes, I have both mm -hmm. personal experiences. Um, well, I was hoping that you would tell me that you had, you know, been part of a uh, cult in a church that was on a hill. and. You know, uh, I mean, you could say that I've been part of a cult and that it was Christian. Yeah. Um, I was Mormon for about six months. That also counts. Mm -hmm. Did it for a girl. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I. No. Other than that, no. I did. I do. However, uh, I did know someone in college who actually uprooted his life to go live with a cult for a mm -hmm. while. I don't. Haven't talked to him in like twenty years because he fell off the grid, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I know someone who did that. Um, you know, cults have always fascinated me. Like, you know, to, it's one thing to go to church every Sunday and, you know, put in your, you know, your, your money into the, the collection plate or, you know, do your 10% tithing or whatever. Uh, but it's another entirely to completely sell off your belongings and yeah. go live on a piece of land with other like-minded people and just toil away for nothing while the person who runs this runs the show just gets fat and rich um the the kind of rewiring that has to happen in your brain for that to make sense is fascinating to me uh, so you know i'm always drawn to a good cult story mm. um also, to, you know, in more, also to answer your question, I mean, about situations that happened to me, I mean, I, also, Devil's Creek adjacent is my novella Scan Lines, uh, which takes place in the town of Stafford, just in a different time period. Huh. Um, Scan Lines is also based on a real scenario. Uh, me and my friends were downloading porn one night or thought we were downloading porn and it turned out to be the suicide video of Bud Dwyer holy shit yeah yeah that wasn't fun yeah so uh you know that scenario has always kind of stayed with me and you know that that goes with the story and the truth is I you know there's a always a personal experience in just about everything I write it, that's I, I use that to give what I'm writing authenticity 
Uh, any writer who says they don't do that is fucking lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. I agree. Well, we've come to the end of our show. Um, thank you very much, Todd, for spending the evening answering my questions. Uh, <laughs> Thanks and for having me. Yeah, it was it was fun. Once we did finally get the video going, um, and I would like uh, if you wouldn't mind letting everybody in the chat know where the best place to keep up with you is, and uh, you know current things that you're promoting. Uh, if you'd okay. like to just have a moment. Sure. Uh, so my website is toddkeesling.com. That's K-E-I-S-L-I-N-G. Uh, a lot of people like transpose the E and the I there. Uh, it's not normal spelling. It's K-E-I. <coughs> uh, same as with social media. I'm on. I'm most active currently on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm slowly learning TikTok, so I'm there as well. And I'll be on Twitter as long as Twitter exists or until it doesn't make sense to be on Twitter anymore. I am on Facebook, but that's limited to just people that I know. Uh, please, you know, if we've never met or we've never had any interaction, please don't send me a friend request. I'm not going to accept it. Mm -hmm. um, mostly just Twitter, Instagram, and soon to be TikTok. Uh, Patreon is another one. I do have a Patreon account uh, if you like my work. Or if you download my work for free and feel bad about it, you know, go pitch in a few bucks. That'd be cool. Yes. Uh, Todd's Patreon has a uh, very stellar game night and a movie night also that you yes. can be a part of. Um, I happen to frequent game night as much as I can. Um, and it's yeah. lots and lots of fun every week. We always play a horror game on game night. Game night's usually once, uh, once a week. And, uh, for movie night, we usually watch a, a you know bad or so bad it's awesome uh, horror <laughs> film once a month. Uh, tomorrow night actually is movie night. We are watching the original Friday the Thirteenth. All right. On Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's awesome. That's that's a hard one not to do. Uh, yeah, you, you pretty much have to. Yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Well. Thank you, uh, everybody in the chat, for joining us. Um, if you can, please tune in next week. We will be talking to Stephen Cords about werewolves in a total 180 change of, uh, of subject. And um, that should be lots of fun. So thanks again, and I hope you guys have a good evening. Have a good night, everybody.